Hello, and welcome back to the Wild Gardens. I'm your host, Martin Hale. Today, we're going to visit the Ripley Desert Woodlands State Park. This is a great place. It's the last standing Joshua Tree Juniper Forest in the West Antelope Valley. This is a precious kind of forest. They got a lot of great wildflowers to look at, some interesting plants, and an interesting history that goes with this place. We're also going to meet a friend, Milt Stark, who helped to um, put the roads, uh, the trails, into the park. It's a wonderful story that goes with this, and it's a wonderful place. So let's get out there and have a look. Come on. The land for this park was obtained via a bequest from a local businessman named Arthur B. Ripley to the state of California. We don't have time for a complete biography of Ripley here, but it seems he arrived in the Antelope Valley along with his mother and sister in the early 1930s. Using money from his mother, he was able to amass by some estimates upwards of 12,000 acres of land. He branched into farming and other business enterprises. Many considered him a hard-nosed businessman, if not quite honest. He was a Shriner, and if he considered you had a good cause, he opened up his wallet. After all, his name is on this park. If you were with us when we visited the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve, You'll recall, we talked to members of the volunteer organization PRIMDIA. PRIMDIA stands for Poppy Reserve Mojave Desert Interpretive Association. PRIMDIA is a volunteer nonprofit association that provides assistance in developing interpretive information and programs for the Ripley Desert Woodlands State Park. Recently, PRIMDIA, in cooperation with state park personnel from the Tehachapi District, created a new trail for Ripley visitors to enjoy. In addition, new interpretive panels are being created through this same cooperative effort. You can see another example of teamwork and cooperation when you enjoy this nice shade ramada. State Park personnel and Eagle Scouts built it together. The materials were donated by author and naturalist Milt Stark a gentleman we're going to meet today. All of the elements come together. State park personnel, volunteers from Primdia and other organizations, all working together to bring this jewel of the Western Antelope Valley for all of us to enjoy. Two prominent botanical features that come into view when you arrive at this park are Joshua trees and California junipers. We first saw Joshua trees, botanical name Yucca brevifolia, in our visit to Joshua Tree National Park. While we were there, I mentioned that the name Joshua tree is credited to the early Mormon settlers who likened the branches to the outstretched arms of Joshua, the Old Testament prophet. We also learned in that visit that astonishingly, it's considered a member of the lily family. The structure of the Joshua tree is fibrous, similar to a palm tree. I can't seem to get a good fix on the age ranges of this tree, mainly because of the structure. Being fibrous, there are no growth rings like those you would find in any number of tree species. I remember reading somewhere that if you mark the edge of the habitat of the Joshua tree, you would have marked the boundaries of the Mojave Desert. I like that, and it's true that for me and many others, the Joshua tree is a symbolic plant 
of the Mojave Desert. There's more to the Joshua tree than spiky long leaves and a rough trunk, though. In addition to providing shelter and sustenance to any number of creatures, something fun can happen here in the spring. They flower. I mean they flower. I remember the winter and spring of 1998. In Joshua Tree National Park, in the upper or Mojave areas, there was a light snow. It came late. There was actually snow on flowers that had bloomed, in addition to the heavy rainfall that year. When the time came, it seemed like every Joshua tree in the park was loaded with blossoms. They tell me that there were years like that here as well. They have these delicious-looking creamy white petals that many yucca types display. Different, of course, but also similar. The California juniper, botanical name Juniperus californica, is to me a lovely sight. One of the things that makes this park so special is their presence here. This tree is a member of the cypress family. Many members of this family produce small, berry-like, woody cones on the end of their branches. The trunks have a peeling bark, and when you cut the wood, you get a strong cedar smell. Native Americans boiled or ground the berries. The ground meal was turned into cakes, which could be stored for long periods. The bark and wood were used for other purposes, including the building of homes. Let's go meet a man who can tell us more about the California juniper and a rather special juniper that grows here. Now, this is my new friend, Milt Stark. Milt was kind enough to let me uh, have a book on West Mojave Desert flowers that he's written. That is a precious part of my collection. And Milt was involved with the development of this park. And Milt, um, you pointed out something that's kind of special about this particular California juniper uh, tree, and I thought you might uh, tell us about it. Well, if you look around at uh, the junipers around you, none of them have a single trunk except this one. And it's really rare, and you walk all through the park, and there are many, many junipers. And uh, I did find one that had about a 10-inch trunk, uh -huh. but this is 33 inches before it uh, starts to branch. Now, I have seen other one-trunk junipers, but they're on the side of a hill uh, up in the Tehachapi, and uh, I saw some up there. But in this park, um, and in most uh, juniper ranges, um, you don't ever see a single trunk on a California juniper. Now, how long does it take a tree like this to get this, this big, this tall? Well, if you look at the... Uh, rings and the stumps that have been cut um, probably you'd have to say about 100 150 years at least um, they're they're very drought resistant uh, they have some mistletoe I haven't seen any here in the park but uh, some of the junipers do have mistletoe but other than that uh, they're very drought resistant and uh, disease resistant uh, so that uh, the only thing they're not resistant to is fire. Right. And once fire goes through, uh, the junipers don't come back unless some of the seeds sprout or something because uh, they just don't come back. Now, I mentioned at the introduction uh, of this show that uh, this kind of a forest is rare. I mean, I know it's rare here because this is the only one standing in the West Antelope Valley, I believe, or one of the few anyway. Yeah. But it's as a general rule, this is a, not a, a common, if you add up conifer forest, oak forest, all the forests that are in California, this is a rare kind of forest, a Joshua tree juniper right. uh, uh, forest. Now, uh, it's interesting. I don't believe that the juniper has been studied enough by botanists because I went on the Internet and got a lot of literature on the California juniper, and they indicated, almost uh, two or three of the people indicated they were growing with the pinyon pine and the foothills. Well, we're out on the flat here. Not only that, but there's uh, California juniper in, in Lancaster, um, way out in the desert, and uh, 
it, it just needs to be studied a lot more. Are you telling me they're not supposed to be here? <laughs> Am I telling you that these trees, according to a couple of people, they're not supposed to be here? <laughs> now, now, I don't have any answer as to why this grew like this. It's possible, I think, that the uh, trunks may have twisted together or something, but I, I have no idea, really. It's just a rarity. A lot of animals make their homes in these trees, I'm sure. Um, certainly a lot of wood rats. Uh, if you go through the park, you see a lot of wood rats in the in the uh, center of the uh, junipers. Um, the coyotes do eat the berries and uh, possibly other animals, but uh, they're not digested very well. Uh, but um, there was one theory that this is the way that uh, a seed was treated before it would it would uh, sprout, germinate. I have no idea. Interesting. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, Milt. Uh, I'm told that you've done a planting program, a replanting program, in various places in the park for Joshua trees. And I thought you might show me one so we can see how you did it, why you did it, and tell me about it. So you want to move on to that? All right. All right. We'll take a look. All right, Milt, we're back to a, another spot here, and I'd like you to tell me what this is. Well, first of all, it's a, a Joshua tree, Yucca Breva folia, and uh, we have an, a large area here that was farmed up until 1972, dry farming. Uh, Ripley apparently uh, did it, and uh, after they stopped farming, it grew back in rabbit brush, mostly rabbit brush. There's some California uh, buckwheat and so forth, but we would like for this area to be like the area over here that's never been farmed, which is juniper and Joshua trees. And so we went on a, the state uh, decided to go on a planning program with uh, for the little Joshua trees. And uh, <clears throat> we had to protect them after we planted them. And we, when we planted them, they were very small. We dug holes and tried to mash the dirt around and tried to put them where they would get the most moisture possible and it would keep the moisture. Uh, so that, anyway, we planted them and some of them have grown up like this, some are even taller. But Joshua trees germinate very easily, but they grow very slowly. How slowly? <laughs> it's hard to tell. Uh, I mean, if you take a, an average height of some of the trees here that I've seen, what would you say what their, their age would be? I have no idea. I really have no idea. Uh, estimating the, the uh, age of a Joshua tree is very difficult because it doesn't have rings. Right. The inside of it's like uh, a palm tree. Right. Uh, uh, has what, fibrous. What family is it a member of? Well, I hate to that's, throw you a lid that's debatable. Know that's <laughs> debatable too because Munn said they were in the Agave family and the new Jepson says it's in the Lily family. The old Jepson said it was in the Lily family. Right. Um, so it goes back and forth, but right now it's supposed to be in the lily family. It's tough to see these as a lily. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're beautiful, but they're not lilies. <laughs> well, they're lily because of the linear leaves and because of the um, roots, uh -huh. um, rhizome roots, right. that uh, they will go out and have um, crown sprouts, and but on the root they'll have... Uh, other little Joshua trees growing from that. So they grow both from from the seed and from uh, the rhizome. Okay. Now, I've heard the term petrified Joshua tree. Yeah. I, I'd like to hear a little more about that. Well, what we used to call this petrified yucca, it's not petrified at all. Uh, it's still, but it's a very, very hard wood. And uh, when I was a boy growing up here in the Antelope Valley, uh, we used uh, wood in our cook stove and, uh, back in the 20s and 30s. And uh, my dad and I would go out looking for petrified yucca uh, and throw it in the trailer and bring it home and cut it up into links so we could put it in the stove. And it burned like coal. I mean, the, the so it was uh, hard. really good pieces were very hard, quite uh, opposite of the regular trunk with the fibrous material, but uh, so many people have picked up this petrified 
yucca that it's so difficult to find now. Yeah, yeah. Well, Especially I've seen a few the, pieces laying around. Right. In fact, you showed me a, a one to take a picture of. Right. So okay, all right. So that's what now, that story is. This had to be protected with this wire around it because the wood rats eat it. Uh, the jackrabbits uh, eat them when they're very tender, very small. So we had to protect them. Uh, our success rate was not that great because of the lack of rain and so forth. But right. we did, we came out here and watered them when they were first put in. And, uh, well, in 50 years, you're going to have more forests here. <laughs> right. <laughs> we won't be around to enjoy it, but somebody right. will. Yep. That's great work. Well, thank you very much, Mel. I appreciate your help here. And nice Glad to see you, you again. The Ripley Desert Woodland State Park is about 560 acres in size. You know, the entirety of the Antelope Valley must have looked like this once. This is what it looked like when the early Spaniards arrived. Aside from the fact that there is a lack of native grasses now in the presence of non-natives, I love a Mojave Desert setting like this. I really do. We came here twice to do this show, once in the spring and once in the late summer, almost fall. I wanted you to see the difference and show that this isn't a spring-only place to visit. Ripley's version of autumn leaves would undoubtedly be the California buckwheat. The California buckwheat is considered the most numerous or common plant in Southern California in one variation or subspecies or another. We looked at a California buckwheat in the Sonoran Desert. The tiny flowers that make up the head are really surprising when viewed up close. The shrub itself can be one to three feet in height and more in diameter. I found buckwheat or eriogonum, the botanical name, all over the southern part of the state. In desert settings, chaparral woodlands, Mojave locales like this one, or just growing alongside the road. In the spring and early summer, masses of white flower heads mark the buckwheat. By mid to late summer, they turn this rust color, and that's why I say they are Ripley's version of autumn leaves. And no, you can't make buckwheat pancakes with these. A plant that we've seen in earlier visits to the wild gardens is the scarlet bugler. This is another common plant here in Southern California, and it ranges down into Baja California, Mexico. I never tire of finding these good-looking pen stemmons wherever they are. The long tube-like flowers suggest pollinization by hummingbirds, but I'm told that bees like them too. They're a member of the figwort family. One of the standout flowering plants here at the park is the linear-leaved golden bush. This member of the sunflower family really seems concentrated here. Their range is fairly extensive here in Southern California. If you crush the leaves between your fingers, you get a varnish-like odor. Grazing animals don't like that smell, and the plant doesn't get eaten. Nice defense. Another plant I always associate with the Mojave Desert is the blue sage. The botanical name for sage is salvia. Salvia, in turn, is derived from salve, which means to heal. Native Americans use the leaves of this plant to treat headaches and stomach aches. 
They also believed that burning the plant at night provided protection from evil spirits. Now, I've always thought that the blue sage looks better from a little distance than close up, unlike most wildflowers. When in bloom, the green leaves and blue flowers make a lovely sight. One of my favorite West Mojave flowers is this little gem, the Perry Gilia. In Milt Stark's book on Western Mojavan wildflowers, there's a quote from Jane Pinheiro, one of the moving forces behind the establishment of the poppy reserve. Concerning Perry Gilia, she called them boutonnieres of pink and lavender blue and white Perry Gilia. Sometimes it seems as though some jesting sprite had strewn the ground with flowers as it danced through the forest in the moonlight. For here is one, there a cluster, over yonder a long drift, and again a solid patch of these fragile, pert little white, pink, or lavender blue flowers, set tight to the ground, apparently without any foliage at all. At times, one sees what appears to be a plant bearing pink and lavender and white blossoms all at once, this is merely another jest of nature, she having caused several plants to grow in such close proximity as to appear one. That is one of the most poetic passages ever written about a wildflower, in my opinion. I found Perry's gilia virtually everywhere I've been in the West Mojave Desert. An interesting plant that is found here at the park is the rock cress. The botanical name is Arabus pulchra. The Arabus part of the name refers to the kind of soil or terrain the plant likes to grow in. Arabus meaning Arabia or rocky, sandy desert places. Pulchra means beautiful or pretty in Latin. So we have a pretty plant that likes to grow in desert places. The cress part of the common name is from the Old English, meaning mustard. So the common name, rock cress, means rock mustard. There are many more flowering plants here at the desert woodlands. Well, that's all for today, and what a spot. You have to admit this is one of the more interesting places that we've come to in the wild gardens. This will probably be the last of the Southern California locations that we do, so look forward to doing Central California and Northern California, completely different kinds of locales, different wildflowers, a whole different setting. As much as I hate to do it, we have to leave. But come here and visit if you get a chance. This place is special. Great trails, great scenery. If you come in the spring, great wildflowers. Until then, I'm your host, Martin Hale. So long.